and welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and let's talk about Modern Horizons 3 some more. Certainly, it's getting a lot of buzz in the community, and I will be making a couple of videos that are essentially going to be reviews of the set. As I usually do now, I'll be doing a video, which is this one, where I will be talking about sort of the, the commander staple auto-include type of cards that everyone's going to be playing, and then I'll do another video talking about maybe the more niche cards, but certainly cards that we'll see play in the format. I mean, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find a card in this set that isn't going to see play in the commander format, which is crazy to think about considering it's a modern set. Um, and then I'll also, of course, do a, another video about the commanders from the set. This set obviously uh, has gotten a lot of buzz. And, and I think the main reason why is because there is just so many staply commander cards. Auto includes strict upgrades is a, a term that I likely will be using a lot in this video in particular. This is like the strict upgrade video. This is the, okay, here's a card that you could just easily replace with the one you're already playing that either just does more or possibly it's a land on the back, that kind of stuff. I gotta say, I don't love all of that. And I also should probably mention that I'm gonna be coming out with a video later in the week, actually, which I already recorded. So, you know, and the only reason I'm bringing that up is because I might incidentally reference it. Um, I already recorded that video, but it's gonna come out after my review of the set. And that video will go into this topic a little bit more but ultimately, I don't love, and, and what a lot of people I think might be complaining about with this set, because there's a lot of mixed reviews where it's like, okay, they're making all these cards that everybody loves, and I, I'm seeing this a lot on my Discord, where a lot of, of the guys there are super excited about this set, and other guys are like, oh, here we go again, right? Just a lot of, feels like a lot of strict upgrades, right? Obviously, you'll see what I'm talking about when we get into these cards. I already talked about the flare cycle. You can go uh, watch my video where I talked about that, so I won't go to get into it much here. Again, there's so much to talk about that I was trying to break it up. So I already made a video about the flare cycle, talking about them, and I ranked them in that video, what, which I think are going to get played the most or, or be the most chased cards from the set. Ultimately, I think that the green one, flare of cultivation, the blue one, flare of denial, and the white one, Flare of Fortitude, are going to be the real chase ones. And Flare of Fortitude, for me, is the best. It's going to be the one. I mean, I, everyone likes their free counter spells, but this one really is. And again, it plays into the whole, you know, how, how much does being able to cast it for free play into what the effect you're getting for it? And the white one is, that's the one you really want to be casting for free. Do you want a Teferi's Protection for free? <laughs> of course you do. It's not as good as Teferi's Protection, right? Until end of turn, your life total can't change. Obviously, that's great to be able to cast for free. And giving your permanence Hexproof and Indestructible for free, right? That's the thing you really, even more so maybe than a Counterspell, you want to be doing that for free, right? And I would also give it a little bit of a nod because I think in a white deck, you're more likely to have that creature to sacrifice over a blue deck. So for me, this is going to be the most chase flare from the set and one of the most chase cards from the set entirely. Also cards, and again, I talked about this cycle already, cards that are just so easy to slot into any deck. And again, I already talked about them, so I'm not going to cover them entirely. They are a MDFC land. So on the back, they are a land that enters the battlefield tap that gives you the two colors you need. There is a cycle of them in all the different two color combinations. And as I already talked about in that video, and I talked about in my Evolving Wilds video, if you're still playing Evolving Wilds, these are easy slot ins, right? Your, your Evolving Wilds will give you a landfall trigger if that's the advantage. Like, what's the advantage you're getting? You have a land that enters the battlefield tap that gives you the two colors you need. What's the advantage you're getting outside of that, right? If it's a scry land, you're getting a scry one. That's okay. If it's a Legion Stronghold, it's giving you a double target creature's power and, and it gains first strike until end of turn. That effect to me is can be way better, maybe possibly even game ending, way better than a scry one. Again, there are some that are not super great, but there's a lot of them that for me are just really, you'd be hard pressed to not put them in your decks. Strength of the Harvest is in an aura. Enchanted creature gets plus one, plus one for each creature and enchantment you control, right? That, that's something you probably want to be doing in every commander game. And on the back, it is a white green land. Now you could take just take out a land, I think. That's why these are such easy slot ins. These are not, okay, I already have this effect in my deck and I'm going to take that effect out to put in this. Like I already have, maybe I have an aura in my deck that bumps my commander. I'll take that out and put this in. No, I think you could just take out a tap land and put this in. This is, uh, you know, I, I find that land in my deck that gives me white and green in my white green deck. 
you know, again, I'm only specifically talking about two color decks here. You could maybe look at three color decks as well. I find that land that is entering the battlefield tapped or maybe entering, again, there's a conditional enter the battlefield tap, like the snarls where it's likely going to enter the battlefield tapped. I take that out and I put this in. Maybe later in the game, I draw it. I don't need a land. I just have this fantastic enchantment, right? Stump Stomp is another one. I mean, it's a fight effect. So if you have a Gruel deck that's fighting, which I'll, probably a lot of them are, you could swap out your fight effect for this, or you could just swap out your green red land that enters the battlefield tapped and just have another fight effect it's just such an easy slot in to any gruel deck i think probably the best ones revitalizing repast as i already talked about it's the black green one only cost one mana to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature and give it indestructible at instant speed wow so good right every deck wants to be doing that Every deck wants to one mana instant speed, give my commander indestructible. And it is also a land on the back, right? So this is such an easy slot into any commander deck. Waterlog teaching also is the other ones where, you know, if you got a Demir deck, other than what could, like, maybe this is going to cost a lot of money. I don't know. Again, it always depends on, do these things get played in other formats? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Pretty easy to slot this into any Demir commander deck. And just on the back, it's a black blue land. And... On the front, it's a tutor. Search your library for an instant card or a card with flash, reveal it and put it in your hand. Obviously, there are Demir decks that are doing the flash tribal thing where this is a slam dunk. Of course, it also is cast at instant speed. Tutor for an instant, I mean, there's always going to be at the very least a counter spell or a removal spell that you're going to want to go get. I mean, you could even go get another tutor possibly with it if you wanted to. It's such an easy slot in, right? So we're going to see this cycle, I imagine, a ton in the format. And there's also... A monocolored MDFC land cycle, and that one's going to get played a ton. Again, I'd say there's some that on the front, they're not super great. Uh, you could still play them, but there are some that are absolutely fantastic on the front, like the red one, which gets an instant or sorcery out of the graveyard. Pinnacle Monk. You know, again, you look at that and you're like, okay, a five mana creature that enters the battlefield and you return an instant or sorcery from your graveyard hand, that's pretty good. I mean, it's not great, especially just a 2-2 two -two with prowess. But I'm thinking, again, every mono red deck could easily play this because it's just a land on the back. But also, I think a lot of is it decks are going to want to play this because, again, later in the game, five mana to get an instant or sorcery out of your graveyard doesn't seem great, but it could be game saving for you. And it's also a land on the back, right? So that one, I think, is going to go in a ton of decks. I think the green one also is going to go in a ton of decks. Disciple of Fraley's three green, 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 Elf Druid, three, three. When it enters the battlefield, you may sacrifice another creature. If you do, gain X life, draw X cards, or X the creature's power. And again, as we already know, green wants to be doing the I draw cards equal to that that creature's big power because green decks always have creatures with big power. Do I want to sack my 8-8 eight, eight creature? Probably, right? I mean, it, it, nice having an 8-8 creature. It's also nice gaining 8 life and drawing 8 cards, especially later in the game, right? <clears throat> when you're likely going to be casting this. And again, it's a land on the back, right? And it has that, the stipulation that used to be connected to, I think, Mythic MDFC lands, and now it's on Uncommons. As it enters the battlefield, you may pay 3 life. If you don't, it enters the battlefield tapped. So turn 1, I could just play this tapped, and it adds a green. Very little downside. If I really want it to enter untapped, I can pay the three life and have it under untapped. So very little downside here. And again, you don't even have to take out the, you know, ignore the effect on the front almost. And just, I take a forest out of my deck and put this in. This is such an easy slot into any, at the very least, mono green deck. And then later in the game, I can just play this guy and sacrifice some big creature and draw a ton of cards and gain a bunch of life easy slot into any green deck and i think the mono white one is probably the best auto include which enchanter three and a white human warlock two two when it enters the battlefield destroy an artifact or enchantment and opponent controls if this was not a land on the back i still think it's a very playable commander card because it's a creature that etbs and destroys artifacts and enchantment that's actually not very common right there's only a few creatures that do that so the blinking decks right all those decks can very easily use this already but it's also a land on the back. And again, enters the battlefield tapped unless you pay the three life and gives you the white. So 
you could easily take out a planes in your mono white deck, for example, and put this in and hey, maybe it's artifact or enchantment destruction later in the game. This card kind of feels like a Bazeju to me, where it's a land that also destroys artifacts and enchantments. It's not obviously as good, but mm, could be better because of course it's a creature and I can very easily reuse it by blinking it or getting it back out of my graveyard or whatever, right? So this, this to me is the most auto include MDFC land from the set that can very easily go into any deck. Who doesn't want artifact enchantment removal? At every point during a game of Commander, you want to be destroying artifacts and enchantments. Always. So when is this ever not going to be good, right? And it's a land on the back. Super easy auto include for so many decks. We're still going on the lands here. I haven't even gotten through all the lands. There's also another cycle of lands that have the, you know, whatever you want to call this stipulation, it enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a swamp. So it is very similar to castles. And of course the castle series, there are, those are staples in the commander format, right? Those very quickly became staples in the commander format because they almost always enter the battlefield untapped and have some great other effect. These will be the same. Like a spy master's vault enters the battlefield tapped unless you control a swamp, taps to add a black. So it gives you that color you need. Pay a black and tap, target creature you control connives at X where X is the number of creatures that died this turn. Great. So it's looting, essentially, right? Conniving, draw X cards, then discard X cards. Put a plus one counter on that creature for each non-land card that discarded this way. So it is, I mean, it's putting counters on creatures too. Connive is a great ability in the commander format. And you have a land now that's doing it. Obviously, this is going to go in a ton of decks. The green one too, Shifting Woodland. Again, I'm not going to talk about all of them. There's a cycle of them. Take a look at all of them. They could very easily go in just about any commander deck. Real easy slot. And again, I could just take out a forest and put this in my mono green deck. It enters the battlefield tap unless you control a forest, taps to add a green and has Delirium to a green green. Shifting Woodland becomes a copy of target permanent card in your graveyard until end of turn. Activate only if there are four more card types in your graveyard. So of course, th that's a bit of a stipulation, I guess, but... Mm, having four more card types in your graveyard ain't hard. Every commander deck is going to be doing that at some point during the game. I mean, there's there's so many, so many permanents that you likely want to be turning this land into, and it's at instant speed, which is really important as well. So there's another. We got two MDFC land cycles, and then this land cycle as well that are very easy slot ins to any deck. Still on the lands, Urza's Cave might be, I mean, it could be, the most popular card from this set. It's the one that most easily slots into every deck, of course, because it's colorless. Land Urza's Cave, so it's the same type as its name. Taps to add a colorless. So, you know, how many colorless lands can you put in your deck? Even five color decks put lands in that add colorless mana. This doesn't enter the battlefield tapped. Pay three and tap. Sacrifice Urza's Cave. Search your library for a land card. Put it on the battlefield tapped and shuffle. Every commander deck wants to be doing that, right? As I already talked about. I mean, you could at the very least use this to mana fix, I guess. That would be the worst way to use this card but it, it does work. I can go sacrifice this, get a Triome if I really wanted to. But of course, every commander deck wants to get a land. You're either in the situation where you want to go get your Cabal Coffers with this, or your guy's Cradle, or you're just a really powerful land, or you get you know, your Glacial Chasm, any land that's just really important in your deck. Maybe you even have a deck that's built around a certain land like I do, or you can just use this to go get an answer. Again, I just play this on like turn three or something. It sits there tapping for mana. And then on turn seven, I desperately need to exile my opponent's graveyard because they're playing a Marin deck. I go get my scavenger grounds and then I can use that, right? Or I go get my ghost quarter because my, my opponent has their own guy's cradle and I want to get rid of it, right? So it is go fetch that utility land that can solve problems for me as well. This is probably the most easy auto include slot into any commander deck from this set. And that's saying a lot. All right, let's get to some actual cards. Null Elemental Blast. And there's a big colorless theme in this set, obviously, a lot of Eldrazi. This is one of those cards that I think is the auto-include in the colorless deck, but also can go in a lot of other decks as well. I'm actually curious about this one, how much play it's actually going to see. So Null Elemental Blast, one colorless mana, instant, counter-target multicolored spell, destroy target multicolored permanent. And as I've talked about on my channel before, I have played in a single game that I can remember one single game where everyone was playing a monocolored deck. And funny enough, I had Ravnica at War in my deck when I was playing that game and that card was actually a dud. I couldn't use it. It does not happen often. It is in incredibly rare that that's going to happen. So will this ever be a dead card? I pretty much guarantee that it's not. There's always going to be someone playing multicolored 
deck and of course likely their commander will be and this is going to be i think very frequently used for counter target commander spell or destroy target commander that's what it's going to be used for a lot and in fact we might see a situation we might see a situation where people are going to start getting a little annoyed by this card because it just so easily kills your commander and I, I think there might be a lot of people out there that already are not loving this card for that reason. And there might be a lot of people that are playing this card for that reason. Uh, one colorless mana is not hard. Again, the Urza's Cave, the, we'll cast it, right? Every deck has at least a couple of lands that are adding colorless mana. I would probably, like for me, I might put this in a monocolored deck. I don't know if I would go above that. I don't love a card sitting in my hand that I can't cast until I get the appropriate lands in play. Um, so for me, I think I would probably play this in a colorless deck or a monocolor deck and not outside of that. But it, it's certainly going to see a lot of play in the commander format. Let's talk about Chthonian Nightmare. And of course, there is a big energy theme in this set. And anyone who's already got an energy deck is probably loving it. There is a couple of cards. And of course, this is the best one. I think it's the best one that are doing the energy thing, but you don't need to play an energy deck to use it. It does the energy thing all on its own. Um, I, I've talked about Demon of Dark Schemes in the past, where that that's an energy card. It's doing the energy thing, and it doesn't get enough love, I don't think. I think it's a great card. It doesn't get enough love because people are like, okay, well, I'm not doing energy, so I'm not going to play it. That card works great in any deck, even if you're not doing energy, and Chthonian Nightmare is the same. One in a black enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, you get three energy, and then you pay X energy and sacrifice a creature return it to owner's hand return target creature with mana value x from your graveyard to the battlefield activate only as a sorcery so it's repeatable recursion and of course because you're returning it to your hand you can very easily keep collecting energy so obviously this is fantastic in an energy deck but because it's giving you three energy it's very easy to pay three energy and sacrifice a creature to get a mana value three creature out of your graveyard how many decks want to be doing that of course tons every aristocrats deck is going to have an absolute ton of creatures that they want to repeatedly get out of their graveyard i mean blood artist that's a two mana one that's a guaranteed great target for your um chthonian nightmare any merciless executioner right those effects those guys are very common in aristocrats decks and they're all three mana value and you can repeatedly get them out of your graveyard right so this card even though it's it seems specific it's going to go on a ton of decks and while we're talking about those Plague Crafter, Merciless Executioner, you know, th those effects are used a lot in the format. We got another essentially strict upgrade here. A Cursed Marauder, one on a Black Zombie Warrior, 2-1. When it enters the battlefield, each player sacrifices a non-token creature. So, man, th this really just feels like, and there's a lot of the, the, these kinds of cards in the set that are just, okay, here's this thing you're already doing in your deck. We're giving you just a better version. And this guy... Just finished saying, hey, all those effects are three mana. Typically, this one's just two. And it is making your opponents sacrifice a non-token creature. Now, of course, you can't sacrifice a token creature, but I'm sure you don't care. You'll just sacrifice this guy to his own ability. So again, here's another one of these just strict upgrade type of cards that, I mean, if you're already doing that thing, here's a better version for you, right? Moving on to Strix Serenade. Uh, one blue mana instant counter target artifact creature or planeswalker spell its controller creates a 2-2 blue bird creature token with flying and of course this is hearkening back to swan song which does literally the exact same thing of course but with the other card types so swan song is doing instant sorceries and enchantments obviously a commander staple since forever and here they are doing artifacts creatures and planeswalkers this is certainly going to see a ton of play in the format and the main reason why, again, and why I think just like with Null Elemental Blast, people might start really hating this card. It's a real easy way to counter your opponent's commander, right? This is just one blue mana counter your opponent's commander, which I think a lot of people are really going to be annoyed by. I myself, I don't counter people's commanders like ever. I think that's a waste of a counter spell. It can slow them down a little bit, but you know, I like to counter things that I'm never going to see again. I don't play a lot of counter spells. So when I use them, I use them on things that are like game ending. If that person's commander is game ending, I guess that's the case. I think a lot of people are going to play this card for that reason. Um, and I like Swan Song better. Um, because I find that the non-creature spells are going to be the ones that I, I mean, I'll just say an offer you can't refuse is my favorite counter spell in the format because the non-creature spells are usually the game ending ones, usually not always 
Those are the ones I really want to hit. I want to hit the Cyclonic Rift. I want to hit the Farewell. I want to hit the Aetherflux Reservoir, right? Rise of the Dark Realms, if you're still playing that card, you know, stuff like that. And an offer you can't refuse gets all of those. Swan Song will get most of those. And, and it also gets the removal, right? So you, in a pinch, you can use that to protect your commander, protect your important permanent on the board, stuff like that as well. Strict Serenade is third in line there with those cards. If we're talking about one mana counter spells, I would put Strict Serenade behind those other two because I am more likely going to want to hit the, those things than this thing. Does that mean it's not good? No, of course it's good. It is certainly a card that you could put in any commander deck and you're not going to be sad to see it. I think you're likely almost always going to counter creatures with this. Um, Planeswalkers, it's going to be rare. And artifacts, it's all like, again, there are people out there that think that turn one, I counter my opponent's soul ring. They think that's a good play. I don't. I, I think that's a waste of a counter spell, but a lot of people might play this for that reason. Hey, I can I can play an island past turn and then when my buddy plays his first turn soul ring, I can counter it. Hmm, okay, if you think that's a good play, then maybe you want to play this. I think an offer you can't refuse and Swan Song are both better, but it's certainly going to see play in the format. A card that is certainly going to see play in the format, and this is another thing that they've been doing a lot lately. They did it with the Spree cards in uh, Outlaws of Thunder Junction, and they've done it more here, which is the Here's that thing you want to do in the commander format all the time, and we're just going to give you more modes. We're going to combine it. And this card really is, you know, it's not the epitome of that, but it certainly is a great example of it. Collective Resistance, one in a green instant, has the Escalate ability, which means you pay a green to get more modes, right? So you can get all three modes here if you want to pay, I guess, four total. So the modes are destroy an artifact or destroy an enchantment or target creature gains hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So the only way you're going to ever cast all three modes here is if someone is targeting your thing and you want to give it hexproof and then also you got extra mana lying around. So why not destroy an artifact and enchantment while you're at it? I think that's not super likely. I mean, I, it certainly could happen and the possibilities are great there. That's why this card is super great and it's going to go in a ton of decks. The situation where I need to get my opponent's stuff off the table, I think is more likely. So I'm probably going to be casting this, I think for three mana, just destroy an artifact or enchantment uh, and enchantment, right? So this is three mana, instant speed, destroy an artifact and an enchantment, which of course is great. And again, return to dust, a, a card that I think has been completely power crept out of the format. See you later. I don't know. I, I mean, that's a white card, but still we're at a point now where we're paying three mana for that, right? Crush contraband. Uh, that, that's maybe a better example. I know that's exiling, but if you got a white green deck and you're playing crush contraband, take that out and put this in because it is not only cheaper, but it also has the ability to save your commander if you need be, right? This card essentially is Nature's Claim, which is a really popular commander card and Tamiyo Safekeeping combined into one, right? That's what they're doing now. They're doing, let's take these two cards that everyone is already playing in commander and now we're just gonna combine them into one card. So now you gotta go grab this one because it's just a better version. And funny enough, my Questing Beast deck has Nature's Claim and Tamiyo Safekeeping in it. I could just go out and buy this card and I, I could either, and you know, every, it's up to each individual person how they want to do it. I could just add this card to the deck and then I have more effects like that. I could take out my Tamiyo Safekeeping because now I have a ta Tamiyo Safekeeping effect that also removes artifacts and enchantment. But if I think I have enough artifact enchantment removal in the deck already, I can take out my Dangerous Claim and put this in instead. And now I have another Tamiyo Safekeeping effect, right? So that's where we're at with cards like this, where they're just doing all of these different things that you want to be doing in a commander game. So such an easy slot into any deck. Probably the best example of that from this set is Thraben Charm. This is, I don't know, might be my favorite card from the set. It's really great. It's one of the best charms I think out there. I, I did my ranking video for charms uh, last year, I guess where I rank the charms, this would definitely be maybe top three, I think. It's also mono white. You know, all the top charms in the format you typically think of are like two and three color. This one's mono colored, and I think it's one of the best in the format now. One in a white instant, of course. Choose one. Thraben Charm deals damage equal to twice the number of creatures you control to target creature. 
destroy target enchantment, exile any number of target players' graveyards. So even if you only have three creatures in play, right? This doesn't have to be played in a super creature heavy deck. If you only have three creatures in play, this can be a six damage. That can kill a lot of creatures. I think that's going to be the least best mode. That's a good mode. Creature removal is great. That's the least best mode. I think it's likely you'll want to destroy an enchantment with this or exile any number of target players' graveyards. And of course, the wording there is really, really important. That That's probably the best mode on this card, and that's why it's really, really important. You don't see that a lot. Any deck out there, a white deck, and I have a few that want to keep your graveyard around, this just hits all of your opponents and leaves your graveyard. It's actually not the easiest thing in the world to do. And here you can do it. Instant speed, I exile all my opponent's graveyards, and I get to save mine because I actually want my graveyard. This is like maybe one of the best ways to do it. And then also I can destroy my opponent's Rhystic Study or I can kill their commander or whatever, right? This is a fantastic modal card in the commander format. One of the best charms I've ever seen. Another card that's absolutely going to see a ton of play in the commander format is Grim Servant. Three and a black zombie warlock. Three, two with menace. When Grim Servant enters the battlefield, search your library for a card with mana value less than or equal to your devotion to black. Reveal it and put it in your hand, then shuffle. You lose three life. Tutor on a stick, right? This is an ETB creature that is tutoring. Um, Sidisi would be, I guess, a good comparison here. That's always been a super popular card in the commander format. Still pretty expensive, I think, because having a creature that ETBs and tutors is, I mean, there's just so many ways to abuse that. And here you can as well. You have the stipulation of, oh, it's your devotion to black. So at the very least, obviously you can get a one with this. Go get my soul ring. I mean, that's not the, the best play in the world, but you at the very least will always be able to do that. Lose three life, who cares? Obviously in Mausoleum Secrets, I'll throw that one out. I think that's a very underplayed tutor in the format. That's another one that references mana value. I think you're almost always going to be tutoring for a card that really isn't very expensive, right? I mean, again, if unless you want to go get your Rise of the Dark Realms or, or Decree of Pain or something, but typically you're, the, the really powerful, important card you want to get usually isn't that expensive. Like three mana value. If you can get a three, a devotion of three here, that'll probably get you a whole lot of really, really great stuff in your deck. Again, at the very least, you can go get removal spell or something like that. So yeah, I, I think the stipulation here is not much. This is an ETB creature that is getting you a card out of your deck. This is going to see a ton of play. It fits in a ton of decks, I think. Again, it's a creature. So even if you're just in that sacrifice theme, this guy comes down, I tutor for something, and then I can sacrifice him to, to whatever effect. I want dice triggers. I want recurs, whatever the case may be. I just want lots of creatures in my graveyard. So fits in a ton of themes for sure, but also probably could go in any deck. Decent tutor. Another card that is going to see an absolute ton of play for sure in the commander format is White Orchid Phantom. White, white, spirit knight 2-2, two, two, flying first strike. So I, let me just say, first of all, a two mana 2-2 two, two, flying first strike tree creature alone is pretty good. I mean, I think likely this is going to be a card that is actually going to get played in modern. I used to play modern. This looks like a really good card for a modern deck, I think. When it enters the battlefield, again, with the ETB creature, right? We have abilities stapled on creatures here. Destroy up to one target non-basic land. It's controller may search the library for a basic land card, put it on the battlefield tapped and shuffle so obviously something you want to be doing in every single commander deck and now it's stapled on a creature a really cheap creature in fact just two mana destroy a non-basic land fantastic and funny enough white doesn't really do this this is a little bit of a color pie break here you know th this is a card that you'd think would be red this is like a red ability destroy a non-basic land and your opponent searches for a basic land and puts it into play. We see a lot of red cards that do that. We don't really see it in white. I mean, I guess it's sort of a reverse Knight of the White Orchid. I think that's maybe what they're playing off of here is the Knight of the White Orchid has died and now he, when he comes back and now he's destroying lands instead of <laughs> ramping. Okay, whatever. Obviously a card that is going to see a ton of play. And, you know, again, you can put this in any deck. It's a spirit and a knight. So it's a slam dunk in any spirit or knight tribal deck, but you could put it in any deck. Any white deck could play this card. Again, that's the theme of this video is this could just go in any deck, right? Because you always want to be destroying your opponent's non-basic lands. I guess you could destroy your own so this actually could be, you know, I want to get landfall triggers because it does, again, like I say with Ghost Quarter, you can do that with a Ghost Quarter where I can, you know, it, it actually manifests you. I can destroy my own land to go get the color I need and that you can do here as well. 
because its controller may search their library for a basic land card and put it on the battlefield. I mean, the end is tapped. Nevertheless, if I'm really desperate, I can destroy my, you know, whatever non-basic land that I have in my deck that adds colorless mana and I'm really, it's early in the game and I only have white mana and I need that other color in my deck. And, you know, I, again, it's fringe. Just like I exile my own creature with my swords to plowshares to gain life, to, to save my life. It's super fringe, but it is another scenario that can be used that does make cards like this better. Obviously, though, you're going to put this in your deck because every commander game, you want to be destroying your opponent's non-basic lands without a doubt. Let's talk about Necro Dominance, which is obviously a card that is probably getting a lot of buzz. And it's just funny how things work sometimes where you see this card and as you read it, you're like, oh, that's insane. You know, it's kind of insane to, when you're reading it, but because that other card exists, it, it, it's like, eh, it's okay. <laughs> you know, that's sort of the reaction you get. So black, 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 legendary enchantment. And by the way, this, this is legal and modern, which again, I would love to know what modern players think of this card. So skip your draw step. At the beginning of your end step, you may pay any amount of life if you do draw that many cards. That's the phrase where it's like, uh, that's crazy. Like, that's absolutely insane. You'd think that would absolutely be insane. And, and again, I imagine there's already modern players out there that are trying to build a deck around this and trying to do, I imagine they're going to do the, you know, I draw a, a zillion cards on my end step and then assemble some combo. Like people used to do this with, and of course the, the card that this is referencing, Necropotence. And the reason why, because Necropotence is just strictly better than this, I think. And that's why people are going to look at this card and go, yeah, it's pretty good. Because obviously there's just, a, in Commander, there's just a, a strictly better version. Necropotence, what people would do, and what I heard all the time, is you draw, you know, something like a Shimmer Mirror that allows you to cast stuff with Flash. And then you just, you, you assemble some combo on your end step before you actually have to discard the hand size. There might be some people attempting to do that in Modern. Who knows? Anyway, the reason why it's not as good as Necropotence is because your maximum hand size is five so you know that's a little rough and of course if a card or token would be put into your graveyard from anywhere exile instead so again that's another even worse stipulation where if any card or token would be put into your graveyard from anywhere exile instead so it is disallowing you to have dies triggers which could be really really bad and, and funny enough the the wording here at the beginning of your end step you may pay any amount of life if you do draw that many cards is in a way that wording is better than a, a necropotence, but we have three, I mean, the skip your draw step is obviously the same, but you have two other stipulations that make it worse than, than necropotence though. So here is the one situation where we don't have a strict upgrade. We have a strict downgrade, but obviously the original card is one of the most busted cards ever printed. So just printing a similar version, certainly people are going to play this. Uh, I'm curious how much this one's going to cost. Again, if it's being played in modern, for some combo deck that's going to make it super expensive. And in fact, Necropotence is not even a super expensive card anymore because it's been reprinted a few times. So we might actually see this card being more expensive than Necropotence, which is kind of funny. Um, nevertheless, though, it is certainly a card that's going to get C play in the format without a doubt. Let's talk about Birthing Ritual. And this is a card that I was going to talk in the, about in the next video because it is kind of specific, but it's also super powerful and goes in a lot of decks. So I thought I would tackle it here. You know, I can only talk about so much here, right? This I could make a like two hour video talking about probably all of the strict upgrades and auto includes and commander staples from this set. I'm going to try to cover a bunch in the next video. So as you're watching this video and you're like, hey, yeah, you didn't cover this card or that card. There's a lot of really powerful cards I'll be talking about in the next video as well. Those ones to me, though, feel a little more niche and, and not so much. They just go in every deck. Birthing Ritual is a little niche, but not really. One in a green enchantment at the beginning of your end step if you control a creature. So how many times are you going to control a creature on your end step in a green deck? Pretty much always, right? Unless you just cast a board wipe. Then you may sacrifice a creature. If you do, you may put a creature card with mana value X or less from among those cards onto the battlefield where X is one plus sacrifice creature's mana value with the rest on your bottom of the library in random order. So this is kind of doing the birthing pod thing, but instead of searching, it's doing it by looking at the top of your library. So of course, not as good. However, the wording here, I think, is what makes this card super good and very easily playable in so many decks. 
at the beginning of your end step if you control a creature. So the stipulation here is you just have to control a creature. And of course, you're on your turn. So even if someone just cast a board wipe, all I have to do is just cast a creature, my commander, whatever. Then I will get this trigger on my end step. So all I have to do is control a creature and I will be able to look at the top seven cards of my library. So that, that's it. That's the only stipulation. Then I may sacrifice a creature. So a lot of people thinking there's some risk involved here. There's no risk involved at all. All I have to do is have a creature. I look at the top seven cards in my library. That's a lot. And then I look at what I have in play and I don't have to sacrifice a creature. I'm already looking and I look at the board. And of course I got to do a little bit of math here because if you do, you may put a creature card with mana value X from among those cards onto the battlefield where X is one plus a sacrifice creature's mana value. So I look at the creatures I have. If there's a creature in my hand that I want and a creature in play with one less mana value, I can sacrifice that creature and take that, right? So I can do the math. I can look at the cards and do the math before I choose to sacrifice a creature. So there's never going to be any whiffing here. I mean, you're kind of whiffing a little bit, I guess, if you don't hit anything. But if you're playing a really creature heavy deck, it's unlikely that you will whiff ever. And you might get some fantastic value out of this. This is not as good as Birthing Pot, I don't think, because obviously tutoring is just way better, but it is pretty darn good. And it very easily slots into a whole lot of decks that are just super creature heavy, I think, because you're just going to be getting tons of great value off of this card. All right, I will end off with Echoes of Eternity. And again, there's a whole bunch more to talk about from this set. I will be talking about it in the next video. I ended off with this card. And this is, again, sort of the epitome. Even though this is a colorless card, it is the epitome of both the strict upgrade and also the auto-include in every deck sort of mentality, which I'm not loving of, of recent times, three and three colorless mana. So this is a card that you're likely never gonna play outside of a colorless deck, I don't think, especially because what it's doing. I mean, it, it's possible, a monocolored deck, you could get away with it, it's possible. I mean, a soul ring adds two colorless mana. So a soul ring is going to get you the two that you want there. So it is certainly a, a playable, but because of what it's doing, you know, maybe, maybe not, right? So it's a kindred enchantment, Eldrazi. So of course, uh, I mean, they I believe they got rid of tribal. They don't do tribal anymore. It's now called kindred. This is an Eldrazi card though. That is very, very important. So if you had something that is referencing an Eldrazi card, obviously that references this. If a triggered ability of a colorless spell you control or another colorless permanent you control triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. That wording that we have become so accustomed to now that literally every single set now that comes out, and again, not necessarily a commander set, every single set. You know, it might be interesting to go back and look at how many sets, I mean, I know there was one in the, uh, in the last set, the if a triggered ability or if this thing happens, the panharmonicon effect. We see that in pretty much every set now, and I've already said I'm getting real tired of it. It's getting really repetitive. And this card in particular, I do not love, okay? Then, now that first ability, if a triggered ability of a colorless spell you control, or another colorless permanent you control, triggers, that it triggers an additional time. That might not be happening a ton. It certainly will happen. And that alone probably is enough for people to auto-include this in all their colorless decks. Again, I don't know if you're gonna wanna play this out of, outside of a colorless deck. That makes it niche. But of course, all of the cards I'm talking about here, other than the, you know, maybe the Urza's Cave, because of the colors they're in, it's gonna make it so that you're only gonna play it in the colors. That's already a thing in Commander. It's gotta fit the colors you're playing. This to me is the most auto-include card I've ever seen for the colors, which is colorless, right? In a colorless deck, this is the most auto-include auto card I've ever seen. Mostly though, because of the other ability. Whenever you cast a colorless spell, copy it. You may choose new targets for the copy. So of course, in a colorless deck, that's every spell you cast. Every single spell you cast in your colorless deck, you're gonna get a new one, right? And of course, you may choose new targets for the copy, but as it says in the reminder text, a copy of a permanent spell just becomes a token. So everything you cast, you get an extra copy. I mean, that's so ridiculous. And it's so ridiculous, in fact, that I, I think the only place this might get played outside of a colorless deck is in a mono blue artifact deck, maybe. Um, because of course, your artifacts are colorless spells and it might be worth it there. I think a lot of people, you know, maybe mo mono colored artifact deck doesn't have to be mono blue. If you're playing a mono colored artifact deck, you might want to shoehorn this in there because every artifact you cast, I mean the colorless ones, which is most of them, you're just going to get another copy. So it might totally be worth it. But it, it, there's such silliness that where, I mean, you're just making a card that every colorless deck 
it has to go run out and buy this card and put it in there because it's such insane value. I mean, again, the, the triggering part is like a maybe that happens from time to time. Again, it, it will probably will depend a lot on your commander. But the, the other part, whenever you cast a colorless spell, you just copy it. So every spell you cast in your deck, you're just going to copy it. <laughs> Doesn't get much more auto-include than that, I think. And that really is the theme of this set, uh, which I think a lot of people have complained about already, and I don't particularly love myself, which is the, uh, this whole list that I just talked about here are sort of the auto-includes. And when I say auto-includes, you know, and I've, I've used that term in the past where people are like, you shouldn't say that because it doesn't, I don't have to go, you know, you don't have to, you never have to, you don't have to buy any of these cards. And I will be making a video about that. Again, I already recorded the video because I sort of just did it on a, it's just one of my rant videos. And I, I usually just do those on a whim. That video I already recorded when we're coming out later in the week or maybe next week, depending on when you're watching this. And yes, you certainly do not have to but I'm just pointing out the cards that you could very easily run out and buy. Pretty much every card I talked about in this video are just easy slot ins to any commander deck if you happen to be playing those colors. And most of these are not, they're not really niche specific at all. They can just fit in any deck then they're going to be great, right? And there's a ton of cards from this set that fit into that category. I probably didn't even cover them all. There's probably more I could talk about. There is going to be another video coming up. Again, I'm going to make a video about the commanders, of course. And I'm also going to be making a video of cards that I think are not necessarily auto includes, but certainly going to be cards we're going to be seeing in the commander format that maybe are a little more niche. Stay tuned for that. You guys, let me know what you think of essentially this set in the comments below. Loving it or hating it. We're getting a lot of mixed reviews here. That is it for today, though. And thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.